Colorado is very fortunate to have the representation that it has uh, in the United States Senate, uh, I will say. And that's uh, from 40 plus years of experience here, kicking around the halls of, uh, of uh, Capitol Hill. Um, the thrust of my remarks is going to come from uh, the title of a new book I have out, uh, which is called It's Even Worse Than It Looks. Uh, <laughs> The subtitle is How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Politics of Extremism. And uh, by the way, it makes a great holiday gift. Uh, <laughs> Father's Day's coming right up. If you miss Mother's Day, Mom will be uh, forgiving now if you give her the book. Uh, so uh, this is a, a very difficult time in American politics and a particularly difficult time for Congress. Uh, Congress's approval rating is uh, now at 9%. Uh, John McCain uh, now says we're down to blood relatives and paid staff. Uh, and actually, the blood relatives, I know some of his, a little bit shaky uh, as well. And some uh, more bad news this week uh, with um, a systematic study that showed that the average uh, member of Congress now speaks at the 10th grade level, uh, which is uh, a little embarrassing, but even more so when you realize that the average 10th uh, grader speaks at the third grade level. Uh, so. It's a little tough for them. Uh, we have a presidential campaign that's been uh, heating up. Uh, Mitt Romney uh, was uh, off in Las Vegas last week, meeting uh, in a public setting with Donald Trump and Newt Gingrich, or as his campaign manager called it, the hangover part three. Uh, <laughs> he's, of course, deep into the vice presidential uh, uh, choice. His spokesman said that he's pretty confident that uh, Mitt will pick an incredibly boring white guy. And Joe Biden said, why not? It worked for Obama. Uh, so. I'm actually uh, partial to uh, uh, what I think would be the uh, best balanced ticket, which would be uh, Romney Gingrich. You get a Mormon and a polygamist. It works. But there's, there's actually balance in another way. You can appeal to uh, middle-aged guys. Uh, middle-aged guys uh, think they look like Mitt Romney. They actually look like Newt Gingrich. Uh, so. <laughs> there are other possibilities, of course, including from some of his former rivals. Uh, there's, uh, well, actually, uh, I woke up yesterday morning. It was 61 and foggy, uh, just like Rick Perry. Uh, so. <laughs> And uh, I think my favorite moment in the Perry campaign came when he was asked what he would do about the West Bank, and he said he'd bring back free checking. Uh, so. <laughs> and then there's the uh, one candidate remaining in the race, Ron Paul, who's still campaigning uh, and uh, picking up delegates, uh, actually. I've been rooting all along for Ron Paul. He's for legalization of prostitution and legalization of drugs, and I just want to be at the victory party. Uh, so, But he brings some drawbacks uh, as a running mate. Uh, he was campaigning in Texas just a couple of weeks ago and was up near Odessa, went into a nursing home and went over to one of the residents and said, now, do you know who I am? And she said, no, but if you ask at the front desk, they'll tell you. So. <laughs> So there's a lot more where that came from, uh, but I'm going to have to move on uh, because of time. But I did want to get you laughing because it's all downhill uh, from this point on. <laughs> I have been in Washington for uh, a little more than 42 years immersed in our politics, and I have never seen it this bad, uh, this dysfunctional. And we've had plenty of periods of dysfunction. Uh, the system is not supposed to operate smoothly, efficiently, and with everybody, uh, you know, to use the cliched phrase, sitting around the campfire, uh, holding hands and singing kumbaya. Politics is war by other means, and uh, our system is designed to be inefficient. It has partisanship built deeply into it. Uh, it's not wrong to, uh, to have uh, partisanship. Uh, it's almost inherent in a democratic system where you need to have ways of resolving disputes, resolving elections, uh, resolving uh, changes in power. Um, and you expect people to fight hammer and tong over things that they care about. But we're in a different plane right now, and it's a disturbing plane. Uh, and it's there because we have a starker level of polarization. 
uh, both ideological and partisan uh, than I have seen, and uh, there's a lot of uh, evidence to document that. But, uh, one part of the problem is that the ideological polarization is actually not as great as it appears on the surface. Um, it's much more a tribalism that we have now, and it's less what you say than who's saying it. Now, I can give you a couple of examples, and some are familiar to you. Uh, the fact is the Affordable Care Act, the health care reform bill, that is, at least as of the moment, still law, was fundamentally the Republican alternative to Bill Clinton's health care plan in 1993. The architects of that plan were the late liberal Republican John Chafee of Rhode Island, the former senator uh, from my home state of Minnesota, Dave Dernberger, who remains one of the great health policy experts, who was a moderate conservative, and Orrin Hatch and Chuck Grassley, two very conservative current members of the Senate. Now, fundamentally what they wanted to do at the time was they feared uh, that we were uh, heading towards a single payer system and they wanted to have competition among private insurers. So you do exchanges that have to be regulated because buying health insurance is frankly like buying a mattress. Uh, if you've ever gone on e-insurance or one of those sites, you have a really difficult time once you get past the surface making head or tail out of what's actually there in the plan or not. But also, if you're going to make it work as a market, you have to expand the risk pool. So you can take away uh, people uh, either making strategic choices, not coming into the marketplace until they're sick, or being banned from coming into the marketplace for one reason, or cherry picking, where they just pick the healthy people and leave the others behind. So that's why the Heritage Foundation and a group of conservative economists came up with the notion of the individual mandate, which people like Hatch and Grassley embraced as recently as five years ago. Now to them, it's socialism. Uh, now maybe they had some revelation uh, on the road to Damascus in the last few years, but I doubt it. And I think what's happened is once it becomes something that's promoted by the other tribe, you reflexively move against it. Uh, another good example for me is when we were starting to consider the debt reduction issues. And here you can look at uh, the fact that the ideological divide in general is not as stark as it seems. We put together outside groups, Simpson Bowles, ranging across the spectrum, Rivlin Domenici, the same uh, range, and an even greater range in the one group inside this tribal dynamic that actually did come together, the Gang of Six in the Senate, that went from Tom Coburn, who I think accurately describes himself as the most conservative senator, across to Dick Durbin, who is a proud progressive. Uh, and they all say the same thing. The template is you need about $4 trillion in debt reduction over 10 years to get us onto a stable path where we don't careen out of control. A significant amount of it, third to a half, has to come from revenues. Because the reality is, our revenue base is now at just over 15% of GDP, which is the lowest in 60 years. And spending is up. Now, it's up in part because you hit a deep recession and spending is going to go up. But the other significant factor is, we have a population where the proportion of people who are older is growing and people are living longer. That will inevitably increase the burdens unless you basically decide to say to all of those uh, elders, you're on your own, which we are not about to do. You can make it work more efficiently, and you can keep it from going up as dramatically as it will as a share of GDP, and you have to, as all of these plans say. You've got to reduce the growth path in the big programs, particularly Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid, by the way, has as its largest component long-term care for the elderly, uh, and uh, with Social Security. You also have to restrain the growth of all other spending areas so you can keep the budget from growing to 25 or 30 percent of our GDP. You can quibble over which parts of this plan you adjust. Do you make the revenue portion 35 percent? or 45 or 50 percent? How do you slow the growth path for Medicare? What parts of discretionary spending do you begin to adjust downward? All of that, but the template is there. And of course, the signature uh, uh, 
plan is the Simpson-Bowles one. Simpson-Bowles was a presidential commission. Uh, presidential commissions we've used frequently, and they can be important and powerful, but they don't have a lot of teeth because they don't have the force of law. They're created by executive order. Well, before Simpson-Bowles, we had a proposal in the works to create a commission with teeth through uh, law. It was promoted in a bipartisan way, commendably, by Democrat, moderate Democrat Kent Conrad of North Dakota and conservative Republican Judd Gregg of New Hampshire. And throughout 2009, there almost wasn't a day when Mitch McConnell didn't take to the floor and say, the way we've got to go here is Greg Conrad, the Greg Conrad Commission. That's the path we need to take. And we had a slew of co-sponsors on both sides. And lo and behold, it came up for a vote in the Senate, and it failed, it failed on a filibuster. And it got 53 votes. Didn't get to the 60 that are now the norm. Why? Because seven original Republican co-sponsors of the bill voted against their own proposal. Now, how do you explain that? Did they look at it and say, how could I have sponsored that in the first place? Where's my staff? They didn't read this to me. No, they didn't say that. It was basically because President Obama embraced it, and all of a sudden supporting it would have been something that might have given him some credit or credibility. Now, that's part of a larger phenomenon, and it's a phenomenon that hits everybody in this process, and it's the permanent campaign. Everything now gets channeled less into problem solving and more into where can you get traction against the other side. And that has been building for decades. It's been building particularly acutely since 1994, when after 40 years of Democratic majorities in the House, uh, Republicans were able to capture that majority because Newt Gingrich found a formula for doing it. That formula was to destroy this institution in order to save it, to create a sense of disgust great enough in the public that they would say anything would be better than this, because the fact is Democrats had found a wonderful formula, which is no matter how much people don't like the institution, have an election where it's all about the individual races and the individual incumbents, and you all get out there and say, hey, I'm Wyatt Earp. I'm trying to clean up that saloon filled with the rowdies. And people loved their congressmen and hated their Congress. The incumbents had name recognition. They had money. And so they could keep perpetuating themselves. So the approach may have been, in a strategic sense, the right one. But over 16 years that it took Newt to get there, it created a much, much greater division and a group of progeny coming in who really believed that this place was the root of all evil, and that spread outside as well. But with that election, we ushered in an era that is still with us of close party competition, where in any given election, you can imagine the majority shifting hands. And if you put that together with the other reality, which is over the last 40 years, our parties have changed dramatically. We have gone from big tent parties, where the Republicans had maybe 30% of the members in the House and Senate who were moderates and liberals, and where the Democrats had 40 to 50% of their members being conservatives, mostly southern, uh, rural-based conservatives, to one now where the parties have become much more homogeneous and move further apart. Now, the contrast is much greater on one side than the other. If you think about a system that's changed from one, when I came to Washington, where the vast majority of members, to use the football field analogy, were somewhere near the midfield stripe. Now it's a barren midfield stripe. The Democratic Party is clustered generally around its own 25-yard line. President Obama is actually much closer to the 40 uh, in his uh, approach to things, even though he's uh, very much in his own ideology a progressive, but he's much more pragmatic. But the party is around the 25. The Republicans are behind their own goalpost right now. And we have voting studies that show a very dramatic change. And we have studies, uh, political scientists uh, Keith Poole and Howard Rosenthal have developed a measure for uh, looking at ideology where you can go back even to the first Congress. And on that basis, the Republican Party is more conservative than it's been in a century. So ideologically, it has changed. But again, I'll give you the caveat. No matter how much you've changed ideologically, we know just based on facts that there are certain things you've got to do to create solutions to problems. 
that template for debt reduction is there, and you may have a difference over which areas of government you uh, cut back on, over how you raise the revenues, even over how much you raise in revenues. But you can't get away from a reality of what you've got to do, which has to include either some revenue increase or basically uh, ending most of government. Uh, and that's not something that even most conservatives want to do. So all of that has created parliamentary-style parties, but in a system that doesn't tolerate parliamentary-style parties. We have, unlike a parliamentary system, not one election where you choose a majority and the majority has the tools to act, and then uh, within a few years, voters can judge whether those actions meet their approval or not. The minority votes against reflexively, but that vote is a symbolic vote uh, because the majority has the power to act. We have separate elections for the House, the Senate, the White House. Uh, and uh, we don't have the same kind of ties that a parliamentary system has. And we don't have a culture that accepts the legitimacy of a majority acting without anybody on the other side. So you look at the first two years of the Obama administration, and yes, they had uh, the reins of power. But we now have a new twist in this process that is a part of this new politics, which is you don't require uh, or you need more than just a majority. You need 60 votes in the Senate for everything. And that is different than at any other time in our history. Uh, used to be that the filibuster was used very rarely. It was used only for issues of great national moment where a minority felt deeply and intensely about them. Now it's used routinely. It's used even on issues or nominations that are, uh, end up passing unanimously used only so that you can stretch out the time, the most precious commodity in the Senate, and as a weapon of obstruction, basically. But in the first two years of the Obama administration, there were times when they got to that 60, and we had actually substantial productivity, as you might have in a parliamentary system. We had the stimulus package passed, we had the Affordable Care Act, we had Dodd-Frank, among many other things. But in our system, if those things are not done, with some measure of broad bipartisan leadership consensus, you don't have the underlying sense that the actions are legitimate. You have half the process believing they're illegitimate, and you get what we're seeing now, which is ongoing attempts to repeal and, at minimum, to keep them from being implemented. So we're seeing something else that's unprecedented now. Uh, nominations in the past, the Senate has a, a consent power, uh, advice and consent. Uh, it was used rarely to block presidential nominations for executive positions, used uh, only when uh, the Senate believed that somebody was way out of the spectrum ideologically, was not qualified, or had some uh, issue of moral turpitude. Uh, now, we have something different. Take two positions. The head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a key implementer of the Dodd-Frank legislation, and what you have is a Senate minority saying, hey, we don't care how well qualified they are. We don't care how many Nobel Prizes they've won. We're not going to let anybody into that position because we don't like the law. It's a, a law that was, whether you like it or don't like it, it was enacted according to the Constitution, but now it's a new nullification. We're just going to keep it from being implemented. And we see the same thing with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is the point position for implementing the Affordable Care Act. Same thing. We're not going to confirm <coughs> anybody to that uh, position. The person who is acting right now, who's been nominated to fill it, was a head uh, of uh, a nurse who headed up the health care program in Virginia, has actually been given a rave review by Eric Cantor, the uh, House Majority Leader. But that doesn't matter because you don't view the act that was passed as legitimate, and you're going to keep it from being implemented. That's no way to run policy uh, in a country. And of course, then you move to the nightmare in our political system, if you have parliamentary parties, which is divided government, where if you have a minority that acts that way, a minority defined as the party that doesn't hold the White House uh, and uh, votes against everything, you can get genuine gridlock. And uh, the upshot of that uh, is that the uh, a uh, major thing that's happened in this particular Congress is the debt limit debacle. 
Um, now, in the end, uh, at the 11th hour, they reached a deal. Uh, but uh, the way in which they went through this process, which was different than we've seen before, the debt limit is a stupid thing to do. Uh, we're one of only two countries that does it. We do it for uh, actually reasons that go back uh, almost a century in our politics. It used to be that every time you had an initiative, you had to go and, and pass a law to borrow more money if you were uh, uh, in that position. And this was to enable more flexibility so you would actually extend it, you would only do it periodically. Um, but it only basically just uh, uh, ratifies the previous debts that the government has incurred. It doesn't actually uh, say, oh, we're gonna go mo more deeply into debt. But because it can be easily perceived that way, it's always been a political football and it's been handled uh, in, in ways that just reflect the rank hypocrisy that can really uh, resonate in a political process. So every time we've done this, and in the time that I've been in Washington, it's about 70 times, uh, you would see the two parties basically take the script that they'd used before and hand it to the other side uh, when the presidency switched. So you would vote for the debt limit when it was your president and say, we gotta be responsible here, it's the full faith and credit of the United States. And the opposition party would have many people saying, I'm not gonna vote to increase the debt limit because I'm taking a stand for fiscal responsibility. And then you just reverse course the other time around. But every time, everybody in a position of authority knew that you weren't really gonna play around with the full faith and credit of the United States. And the leaders had votes in reserve if they needed them. Uh, people who didn't want to uh, face what might be the 30-second attack ad, he voted to increase the debt, but would do it to keep the United States uh, on an even keel. This was the first time we would had the debt limit actually used as a hostage for non-negotiable demands. And despite the deal, we had our credit rating downgraded. Now, I don't have a lot of uh, 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 warmth felt towards ratings agencies. Um, standard and Poor's is standard and poor. Uh, <laughs> but they had a point. And the point was, we looked at the way you did this and the way you're conducting your politics now, and how can that give us any faith that in the future you're actually gonna resolve these issues? And when you look at what happened with the deal that was reached, which if you said, gee, if you've got a dysfunctional political process, how can you create something that will actually force you to do the right thing? All right, you create an outcome that occurs if you don't, which is disastrous. The guillotine falls, that's the mindless destructive across the board sequesters in defense and discretionary spending, and then you create a super committee on steroids that's like the Avengers uh, who uh, can do anything they want and get an automatic up or down vote in both houses, and they still couldn't do it. And that tells you why it's even worse uh, than it looks. And don't forget holiday gift. Uh, but why we have to be concerned. And I'll end just by saying, uh, I uh, uh, co-authored this book at this point in a way that's gonna uh, lose me some friends because I looked out at this country and see that we have urgent, short and long-term problems that we've gotta solve. We do have the problem of an economy that is, it's a dilemma that's always there when you have a, an economic crisis caused by a financial breakdown. You have the problem of uh, massive debts built up at the government, business, and individual level, and you need to deleverage, reduce those debts, but if you do it too quickly, you uh, do the equivalent of the medieval practice of bleeding an anemic patient, and you can cause disaster. So you've gotta actually add to that, those debts in the short run, to stimulate growth, and then make a pivot at the right moment to keep the debts from careening out of control. If you had a perfectly operating political system, that would be tough to do. With dysfunction, you can make it worse at both ends. And at the same time, we now have problems with long-term unemployment that can create tremendous long-term problems in our society. We know if people, young people of getting out on the career ladders uh, are knocked off that first rung or second rung for a couple of years, they never reach the uh, rung that they would have otherwise in their careers, and the levels of dysfunction in their own lives 
of uh, alcoholism, drug abuse, uh, of um, uh, divorce, uh, even of uh, depression and suicide are much greater. We've got to keep that from getting worse. We've got to make sure that we maintain the crown jewel of our university system as tuition is going up beyond a point at which it's sustainable uh, without creating damage. We've got to be able to function in a global economy. Uh, and that's not easy to do uh, in a tribal uh, conflict uh, such as the one we have now. And I'll just end uh, with a, a note of optimism that also comes from John McCain, who said, it's always darkest uh, just before it turns completely black. Uh, so 